good morning good afternoon good evening thank you all for joining us this morning or afternoon or evening and welcome to the workshop on the method of averaging applied um, applied to pkpd modeling by dr adrian dunn we are really excited to share that we have received great response and have had 163 registrants for this workshop from around the world and like always we have had um, seen great enthusiasm we have today so we have participants from brazil india japan malaysia singapore us south africa and many other countries from around the world thank you for being here and thank you for giving us this opportunity to share this knowledge as you know today's workshop is hosted by project dantabhaktuni and is sponsored by pharma pro consulting on dantabhaktuni.org at gmail.com and you may have received um, a meeting invite also from that same email and we will be available to address your questions post the workshop as well and dr dun has been um or i or any of us would be happy to help you address your questions our overall objective is to expand your knowledge on pharmacometrics and not only with this workshops but many of the other workshops now some of you may have attended our previous workshops as well and we look forward to having you back again in our future workshops for those of you who are new just to give you an overview about who we are and what we stand for and of course before i start introducing you to uh, project dantabhaktuni let me introduce myself i am aruna dantabhaktuni your host i am the founder and ceo of pharma pro consulting and also the founder and scientific director of project dantabhaktuni project dantabhaktuni is a non profit organization that is created to support scientists and students postdocs from around the world in fulfilling their dreams and objectives in growing their careers in the field of clinical pharmacology and pharmacometrics that's how we are contributing towards your training and development supporting you by creating these workshops training programs and mentoring programs so how can you support us you can support us by joining hands with us and helping us in being mentors in our workshops and training programs and of course by spreading the word and thus is our motto which is empowering you to empower others so our request is that whatever you learn from us please pass it along to other fellow members in your scientific communities so we can let the science grow with us our past workshops so last year we had hosted uh, multiple hands on workshops and the year before that few of us had visited india and china and hosted uh, on site workshops at many universities Uh, there and overall in the past 2 years we have had over 1500 participants take advantage of our workshops and we continue to do that uh in 2021 as well so without further ado i would like to tell you a little bit more about today's workshop so just to get you let you know and so you are connected with who are the other participants here in the workshop so we have 
uh, in today's workshop, as you can see, we have many participants who are PhDs and um, about 30 or 34 percent are postdocs. We have PharmDs and also uh, bachelors in pharmacy participants. And there are a few who come in the others category who, who could be MD, PhDs, et cetera. Welcome you all to this workshop. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to share this knowledge with you. And without further ado, I would like to invite our today's speaker, Adrian Dunn. So to tell you a little bit more about Dr. Dunn, Dr. Dunn has a background in statistics and has been in this field for over 40 years. He has over 35 years of experience in pharmacometrics. He was an associate professor in the University of California, San Francisco, where he worked with Dr. Shiner and Dr. Bell. Adrian has spent over 30 years in statistics and pharmacology department in the University of uh, in the University College of Dublin. He has spent six years working with Johnson and Johnson. And currently he actually runs uh, a training company which is focused on creating similar workshops wherein he bridges uh, pharmacometrics and statistics. His training programs are extremely popular and it's our pleasure to have Dr. Dunn with, with us here to give us an, um, uh, a talk on the method of averaging applied to PKPD modeling. Thank you so much, Dr. Dunn. And now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so Dr. Dunn can start his presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Aruna, and welcome everybody to uh, this webinar. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for the invitation to uh, make this presentation to you today. I hope um, this is something that uh, you'll get, you'll, you'll learn something new and something that might be useful to you uh, in your future PKPD modeling uh, exploits. Um, First of all, I should acknowledge uh, my uh, former colleagues in uh, Janssen who worked with me um, on a, a project which we'll talk about later. And it was as a result of that project that um, this method of averaging applied to PKPD models uh, came about. Um, I'd also like to mention uh, Partha Nandi, who I think is uh, joining in on the call today, who was a colleague of mine at Janssen. Uh, Partha's help and advice were always greatly appreciated. And he was my go-to man with lots of the projects I worked on when I was uh, working with Janssen. So we'll begin with um, just a brief outline to uh, let you know what we're going to do. We're going to begin talking about PKPD indirect response models. And then I'll talk about the method of averaging and uh, how that can be used in indirect PKPD indirect response models. Now, it's all very well having a methodology uh, developed, but you need to have uh, software for to do it. So I'll talk to you about the non-MEM implementation of this method of averaging uh, for your PKPD modeling. And we'll take an example, which is the project that I worked on with, uh, with Janssen. And then we'll do a comparison between the method of averaging, which I call MAV, met M average, and NDES, which is numerical differential equation solver. This is, if you like, is the traditional or the standard way that you might fit these models uh, using non-MEM. 
I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the non-MEM code as well. I, I won't go into it in very fine detail, but I hope I'll give you enough detail for you to be able to um, use this method in, in your own work. And then we'll, we'll end up with, uh, with a few con con conclusions at the end. So we'll begin with a PKPD indirect response model. So I'm using Y here to indicate the uh, response, the PD response variable. And of course, it's a function of time because it changes with time. And in a PKPD indirect response model, we essentially have a model where the, if the response variable, the PD response variable Y, is uh, influenced, if you like, by two processes, a zero order input process and a first order output process. And so this entire model then can be written in terms of a differential equation, which shows the rate of change of the response Y is equal to the input, the zero order input, as you can see here, its rate constant is K in, minus a first order uh, output where its rate, rate constant is k out. And the idea then, which we'll see in the next slide, is that the drug has an influence on either k in or k out. So the, either the input process is influenced by the drug or alternatively the output process is influenced by the drug. Now, four such models have been, again, I'm just repeating at the top of the slide here, that differential equation, which shows the rate of change of the response depending on the input and the output. Um, and four such models have been uh, delineated. Uh, model one is where the drug reduces K in. And so K in is reduced by the drug. And so that therefore the influence of the drug is just here. Model three is similar in that it increases rather than reduces. But again, the effect of the drug is to influence the input rate. And then model two and model four, the drug has an influence at, on the output side. Uh, in model two, it reduces the output. And in model four, it increases the output. So we've got four models there, uh, increase or decrease on the input rate constant and increase or decrease on the output rate constant. And so there are four, four models. Now, in fact, you can write all four models. Uh, sorry, I should go back here a moment and just tell you that now I haven't written in here, I will on the next slide, I haven't written in here the drug influence. I've just told you the drug is going to change either the K in or the K out. But now we'll write that into the model. And all four models can be written using this expression here where you'd see the K in minus K out plus, and this is the drug effect that I've written over here. Now, C of T is the plasma concentration of the drug at time T, and the F of C of T is a function which describes the exposure response model. So this will be in, in the example I'll show you later on, it will be an Emax model, but it could be, you could use other models if you wish to. So that's whatever model you want to use for your exposure response model. The YT to the power of lambda, when lambda is zero, then we're talking about the a zero order process. So the drug is then influencing the input. So the input would be K in plus alpha times this. And um, if, if lambda is one, then we're talking about first order processes. And so what this is doing is it's influencing the K out. So the, all four models can be written by this one equation here. And down here, I've shown you that the when lambda is zero, we're talking about zero order, in other words, influences on the input. So that's either model one. So if for model one, if alpha is minus one and lambda is zero, the input is K in minus F of C of T. So there we've reduced the input by the drug here and that influence is uh, determined or described by this um, response function, exposure response function, F of C of T. If we go to model three, you'll see that lambda is again zero, so it's a zero order process, and alpha is equal to plus one. So what we're doing is the F of C of T is increasing 
the input. And so it's K in plus F of C of T. So that's model one and model three. Now for model two and four, lambda will be one because they're first order processes where they influence the output. And so in model two, alpha is plus one and lambda is plus one. So the output then becomes, we take these two terms and put them together and write the output. The output will be K out minus F of C of T times YT. And for model four, it's the same thing again, except we change sign. And so the output is being, in, the drug is increasing the output rate constant. In model two, it's reducing it. So that's a very handy expression up that we have up here where we can write all four models using the same equation. And so if we stick to that equation, then we can apply our methodology to any one of these four models. So I'll rewrite the equation again here. Now, this is a differential equation, of course, and the, that and the PK model equations, which I haven't shown, are often solved numerically, and that's what I call NDES, or numerical differential equation solver. Now, the problems that arise when you try to solve these numerically um, are, first of all, the PK equations are being solved repeatedly over many dosing intervals. Now, after the drug has reached steady state, you are then going to keep solving basically the same equations and getting the same solution over and over again. And that, of course, is very wasteful of computing time. So that's the first thing. So if, if the, uh, once the plasma concentration has reached steady state, you're going to keep solving the same equations. And that's clearly not something that's very desirable. The second point is that if the, the uh, PD response changes slowly compared to the plasma concentration, which it frequently does, then the step size for solving these differential equations, they're solved by taking steps, will be governed by the CT and will be very small. And so this will result in very long run times, hours, or maybe even days. I'm sure you've all uh, experienced some of this. So there are two things here. One is the unnecessary, if you like, solving again and again the PK equations after steady state has been reached. And secondly is the uh, unnecessary uh, step, small step size in solving the PD differential equation, which is given at the top of this particular slide. So I can just pause there for a moment if anybody's got any questions so far before I go on and start talking about how the method of averaging can be used for to solve some of these problems. We have one question, Adrian. Yes. Uh, uh, could you please give us an example, physiological example of indirect response model? Uh, well, I'm going to show you an example later on um, based on uh, the drug canagliflozin, which is used in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And in that case, the uh, effect of uh, canagliflozin is to reduce uh, plasma glucose and the reduction in plasma glucose then uh, results in a drop in the um, production of uh, glycated hemoglobin. So uh, we'll see that example uh, later on, but there are lots of examples in the literature uh, where the, these models origin, originated, as far as I know, in uh, the University of Buffalo with Bill Jusko's group. And I think they have published uh, uh, numerous examples um, of the use of these models. Thank you, Adrian. That's for now. Uh, for the participants, please uh, put in your questions in the chat panel, which will be asked uh, in the course of time. Yeah. Uh, hi, Adrian. Uh, Sopnil has raised hand. I'm unmuting Sopnil. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I thought it was a question. Okay, so we'll move on then. So the method of averaging. Now, the method of averaging has been around for quite a long time. I don't know exactly how far back it dates, but uh, it's been used by engineers, mathematicians, and various other uh, groups of people. But to my knowledge, it hasn't been used in the pharmacometric world until uh, a few years ago when um, we needed to do it. And we discovered that this was this 
part of the solution, at least to the problems that we were experiencing. So let me tell you, first of all, that there are two conditions that must be met for to uh, use the method of averaging. The first one is that the plasma concentration time curve has to be periodic. And what I mean by periodic is we have to have the same dose administered at equal time intervals, and it must be at steady state. Okay, so that basically what we have is we have a plasma concentration curve which just keeps repeating itself. And in this case, I'm going to describe the dosing interval by the Greek letter tau. And the second condition that has to be met is that the uh, re PD response changes very little over a single dosing interval. And again, when I come to my example, uh, you'll see an example of uh, where that's true. Now, what, ha what happens when these conditions are met? What can we do? Well, what we can do is we can go back to this equation that I had here. This is the equation for the indirect response model with the drug effect added in here. Now, by the way, there is no restriction on this function down here. So if you, whatever um, exposure response model you want to use can be put in here into this model. There's no restriction on that. So suppose we were to take that equation and we were to integrate it from some time I'll call t to a time called t plus tau. So I'm going to integrate it over an entire dosing interval. And then I'm going to divide both sides, left and right, by tau. And what that gives me is when I integrate this, I get y at t plus tau minus y at t. And then I'm dividing by tau. So here's the division by tau. And on the right hand side, this is a constant, so it's just k in, and this one here. Now, I'm going to treat yt as if it were constant, and I'll talk about that again in a second. So this becomes a constant. The same with this piece here is also a constant. And we end up with just the integral of f of ct dt integrated over one dosing interval and then divided by tau. And so that's the solution. Now, one of the things about that solution is you'll see that that's an approximate solution. You'll see that I have not an equal to sign here, but a wavy equal to sign, which means approximately equal. Now, the reason that it's now approximately equal is that because we have treated yt, when we did the integration back here and integrated this, we treated yt as if it were constant over the dosing interval that we're integrating over. So. Um, and of course, it's not completely constant, but if it's close to being constant, in other words, if it changes very little over the dosing interval, then this should be a good approximation. Now, the second step then is to look at the left-hand side and to realize that if the dosing interval is short compared with the rate of change of yt, then the left-hand side is approximately the derivative of dyt dt. So this is the slope of a chord of the curve, and this is the slope of the tangent. And what we're saying is that the slope of the tangent is approximately equal to the slope of the chord. And that will be true, or that will be a good approximation when the uh, tau is short compared with the rate of change of yt. Now that's essentially the same approximation approximation that we made, we said yt doesn't change much over a, a, a one dosing interval. So that's effectively the same um, approximation being used there. So now we have this interesting thing where we will have a, an integral on the right hand side. And I'm going to describe that integral 1 over tau times the integral of f of c t g t over one dosing interval as e average. Now, the reason I describe it as an e average is because an integral, as you probably know, is effectively a sum in mathematics. So what we're doing is we're, if you like, we're adding up this f of c t across an entire dosing interval and then dividing by tau the, 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 the uh, dosing interval width. So therefore, this is an average and it's an, a, an average for f of ct over one complete dosing interval. And of course, it's for a particular subject because it may be different uh, for each subject. And so this is where the name, the method of averaging comes from. This average here, the, I describe it as E average, the average effect, if you like, of the drug. Now, one thing to note about this is that this function f, the exposure response uh, function, 
is a nonlinear function, almost certainly it's a nonlinear function of the plasma concentration. And in that case, the E average is not the same as F of C average. So the average drug effect over a dosing interval is not equal to drug effect at the average concentration. So you need to be careful there. Now, if this was a linear function of CT, then it would be equal to the, uh, at the average, the drug effect at the con average concentration. But um, that's not the case. So we need to be careful not to make that assumption. So if we combine all those equations together, we now get a differential equation, which is approximately equal to K in minus K out plus alpha YT to the lambda times E average. And here's where my integral is and my E average. Now, if that equa differential equation there actually has an analytic solution, and the analytic solution, there are two versions of it depending on the value of lambda. So remember lambda was um, zero for models one and, and three, and it was one for models two and four. So here's the solution for models one and three when lambda is zero, and here's the solution for models two and four where lambda is one. But in both cases, you'll see that I've managed to solve the differential equation, so there's no need now for differential equation solvers. So use of this equation would greatly increase the computing efficiency of the model fitting process because it's going to remove the necessity to solve the differential equations numerically. And so if we're not solving the differential equations numerically, the two th problems I pointed out earlier on, one, that we are resolving it with the new differential equation solver, we're solving the PK equations repeatedly, even after we have reached steady state, we continue to solve the equations, which is unnecessary. And secondly, we have a very small step size for solving the PD equation. So if we don't need to solve those differential equations, then we avoid all of those problems. However, of course, there are always problems with all these things. And the problem here is that value E average must be computed separately for every subject in our data set using the current values of the PD parameters. Remember the PD parameters will change as non-MEM goes about the fitting process. So at every step of the model fitting process, we'll have to recompute this E average for each one of our subjects in our data set. And so that's, if you like, that's really the challenge that we're going to face. But assuming we can overcome that challenge, we have up here, we have a solution to our differential equation, and we can just plug that into non-MEM and get non-MEM to do the, the business for us. So I'm going to talk now um, in the next section about the uh, non-MEM implementation of this. So perhaps I'll pause there for a moment. And if anybody has any questions on those last few slides, I could, uh, I could take them now. We have a couple of questions. Yeah, uh, first one is, uh, would averaging be helpful if the pharmacodynamics is going to impact the pharmacokinetics? Um, no, uh, I should, yeah, that's a very good question. What um, I should have said was that the, um, if the pharmacodynamics are going to, well, first of all, let me go back here. Um, Sorry, just give me a moment here now. Okay, what we're going to do is what people normally do is they do the kinetics first. In other words, they fit, they fit the model for CT first and then fix those parameters and then fit the uh, pharmacodynamic part. Now, this is not 100% ideal because of course, in an ideal world, you would fit both the kinetic and the dynamic models simultaneously. But there's been a lot of work done on this. That's a big order for to fit both models simultaneously, and it's a huge computing problem. So it's an awful lot easier to fit the kinetics first and then fix the kinetic parameters and uh, fit the uh, PD part. And a lot of work has been done to show that there's very little loss of information, but this is called sequential fitting, where you fit them in sequence. You start with the PK model, and then you do the PD model. 
Now, if you think about it, it stands to reason that the PD will tell us something about the kinetics, but actually tells us a lot less about the kinetics than does the plasma concentration values. So the amount of information, if we were to fit the kinetics in sequence, like I'm suggesting, uh, doing the kinetics first without the dynamic res uh, responses in the model, then the amount of information we lose is very, very little. And there are a number of publications in the literature. There's one, I can't remember when it was, but a long time ago, because uh, I know it was written by Stuart Beale, uh, and he's been dead about 15 years, so it must be 20 or more years ago. And um, there was a paper where he showed that the information loss was very small and that you, it was a reasonable approach. And I think a lot of people since then have adopted this sequential approach to fit the kinetics first and then the dynamics. So that's the way I'm going to do this. So we're assuming that YT does not influence CT, but that CT influences YT. So that's the way, uh, the way these models are constructed. I hope that answers your question. Yep. So we have one more question. So is there any constraints on the PK? For instance, if a drug is subject to TM duty, uh, is the method of averaging still applicable? If, this, if the drug is subject to? TM duty. Uh, Well, the short answer is I don't know. I haven't thought about that. So rather than give you an off the cuff answer, I'd have to think about that um, before I could, uh, I could answer. I'd have to go back and look at the mathematics. Um, in fact, you could do this yourself if you like, because I, I think I've, I hope I've given you enough of the mathematics here for you to be able to look and see if you go back to uh, this equation here and see write down the equivalent equation and see about writing out, uh, about doing the integration, et cetera, et cetera. If you've got enough mathematical skills, I don't know if you have or not for to do that, um, you might be able to look at it yourself, but it's something I'd have to think about because I, I, uh, I haven't considered that before. My apologies. Oh, yeah. Oh, we can take one more question before we move on to the next one. So by how much degree will the computing time reduce with this averaging method? And can this method be applied only to steady state? Um, well, you're going to see, if when I come to the example, a very dramatic reduction in the computing time, very dramatic reduction. I was taken aback uh, when I first ran this. Um, and uh, and it, it actually saved an entire project uh, for us at Janssen, um, this method. Um, secondly, if your plasma concentrations don't reach steady state very quickly, then you may be able to adapt this method. Now, I haven't personally done this because, as again, as you'll see with the example that I'm going to show you, the plasma concentrations do reach steady state rather quickly for that particular drug. We were fortunate, and so we didn't need to adapt it. But you could adapt it. For example, you could have one way of computing that um, integral. If that integral, when I say that it's at steady state, being at steady state means that that integral doesn't change with the value of t time. So the integral will be the same for the same person, for the same subject, for the same values of the parameters, of course, um, no matter what time, what the time is. Now, if it does in fact change with time, you might be able to uh, use different values for that. So I can see a way it could be adapted where you didn't have steady stage reached very quickly. And it's something that you can test out. I'll show you how you can test it out because what you could do is you can fit the model using the method of averaging and you could fit the model without the method of averaging in the traditional way using the differential equation solver and you can compare the two. And if, uh, if there's a big difference between them, then your method of averaging is not working very well. And you might go and look at, 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 you know, at why that was. Thanks, Eugene. Uh, we have questions coming in. Um, in the interest of time, maybe we can start with the session and we can take it, the questions at the latest stage. Okay, so I'll, um, I'll talk now about the non-MEM implementation because it's all very well 
um, writing down differential equations and solving them, etc. But you have to have some way of doing the computations. So um, when I was uh, faced with this problem, fortunately, I had at the back of my mind a little trick that I knew about in non-MEM, um, which I was able to use for to uh, get around this problem. So what I'm going to show you is my uh, approach to the non-MEM implementation of this. There may be other ways. I, I didn't really give it a whole lot of thought because once I found one way to do it, I was extremely happy. And that's the way that we used. So our, my implementation in non-MEM was as follows. I use the dollar pred block because I don't need to have differential equations now. And so I can incorporate my PD model into the pred routine. The only um, thing is that this E average appears in my model. So I have to have some way to compute that. And I have to be able to compute it separately for each subject because each subject's plasma concentration profile is different. Um, and I have to be able to compute it recompute it every time the values of the uh, exposure response model change. And they will change as non-MEM goes through the search procedure. So it's computing that E average in the dollar pred block. That's where the challenge is. So what I did was non-MEM has a facility that um, probably a lot of people don't really know about because they may not have ever used it. And it's called Funk A. And um, it's something that uh, I, I was aware of because I'd had discussions with Stuart Beale uh, at the time that he was writing this in. And uh, so I was well aware of this. Now, the, the idea behind this is that you can compute a function outside the non-MEM code. So it's basically you have non-MEM passing out of non-MEM into a separate piece of code to do a computation for you and then returning back to non-MEM. And that's a very powerful facility to have. So what happens is the user writes and it's Fortran code because of course non-MEM is written in, in Fortran and the, uh, the, 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 the routine is called Funk A. You, there are also Funk B, Funk C, et cetera, but we'll use Funk A. Uh, which stands for function, and there's A, B, C, etc. And what non-MEM will do is it will call that function to compute parts of the model. Now we want to compute this E average and put it into our model. So func A is the is the clearly the uh, obvious way to do that. So that non-MEM will jump, if you like, will jump outside non-MEM to our Fortran code, compute E average, and then jump back again. And funk A can be self-contained, or it can call other code, such as a Fortran library. Now, we didn't need to use this, this instance, but I'm mentioning it because it, this gives us an awful lot of power. So, for example, a library that I have used a lot in the past is the IMSL library, which is the International Mathematics and Statistics Library. And that library contains hundreds of routines for to calculate do all kinds of uh, calculate all kinds of functions, etc. So you'll almost certainly find in that library a routine that will calculate whatever function you want to calculate. Um, so what this means is that you don't have to be an expert Fortran programmer, and most particularly, you don't have to be a numerical analyst because you can use an existing library and know that the code was written by people who probably know a lot more about numerical analysis than you do. Certainly they know a lot more about numerical analysis than I do. And so I'm very happy to lean on their shoulders, so to speak, um, by uh, calling the routines from the IMSL library. Now for the example I'm going to show you, um, we were trying to compute an integral, which is that E average, and that integral turned out to be very simple to compute in, in our case. But if it were difficult, we could have called the IMSL library for to do the integration for us. But in fact, uh, as I'll show you, the code was very simple. So we're going to use this Funk A facility to compute E average for each subject in the data set using the exposure response model and the current values of the parameters of that model. And the way we do that is, First of all, we use the PK model to compute a steady state PK profile over a single dosing interval for every subject in our data set. 
and we store that in a file. So that's a separate run of non-MEM on its own. And uh, it doesn't, well, depending on the model, et cetera, and the data, but it shouldn't take very long for it to do that. Then what we did was we read the contents of this file into the, uh, the computer's memory, the RAM, at problem initialization. And then during the model fitting, go to the computer memory, retrieve the appropriate PK profile and compute E average for use in the PRED routine. And I will show you, um, well, first of all, we'll go to an example where we use this. This is actually the example for which we concocted all this. And then I'll, I'll talk to you later about the code. So my example is canaglyflozin, which is a, it was a, a randomized double blind placebo controlled study in subjects with type two diabetes with metformin as background therapy. And selected subjects were randomized to groups administered placebo, 50 mg, 100 mg, 200 mg, or 300 mg once a day for a period of 12 weeks. And the PD response was uh, glycated hemoglobin, and which this was measured at baseline and at week six, nine, and 12. Now, the conditions necessary for M average are that the PK profiles reach steady state rapidly compared to the duration of the study. Now, this study, as I said, runs for 12 weeks. So it turns out that the canaglyflozin, uh, oh, right, sorry. The conditions are, I'm confusing myself here. The conditions are that the PK profiles reach steady state rapidly and that the uh, HbA1c changes very little over a single dosing interval. Now, both conditions are met in this study because plasma canaglyph flows and concentrations reach steady state within four days. And we're talking about 12 weeks. So um, that's 84 days. So for most of the duration of the study, the uh, canaglyflows and plasma concentrations will be at steady state. During those first four days, as it builds up to steady state, uh, our approximation won't work very well, but it'll work well over the remaining 80 days. The second condition then was that the uh, HbA1c changes very little over a single dosing interval, and the dosing interval in our study was 24 hours. And the reason that we can rely on that is, of course, that the uh, red blood cells have a lifespan of approximately 100 days. So therefore, we would expect very small change over a period of, of uh, 24 hours. So the POP-PK model, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but the POP-PK model was a two compartment model with a lag time and sequential zero and first order absorption. And there was uh, inter-individual variation included on five of the parameters. And there's a reference given here where you can get more detail on the uh, in clinical pharmacokinetics 2016, uh, Eve Huben and colleagues, where you'll get more detail on the POP-PK model. Um, just to let you see, I've shown some uh, steady state PK profiles here. We, first of all, we've got, I've just got three subjects at each dose level, three at dose 50 mg, three at dose 100, three at 200, and three at 300. Um, the between subject variation is fairly obvious, particularly up here at the 300 level with these three subjects, so that the between subject variation has been taken into account. Now, what we did was we used that PK model to compute the steady state plasma uh, uh, canaglyflows and conch at 30 minute intervals over 24 hours. So that gives us what 49 values for each subject. And they, those uh, data then were uh, stored in a data set and the re results then uh, will be in a text file to be used for uh, um, the method of averaging. So I've just shown at the bottom of this slide here, the, the first few records from that uh, file. And the very first record contains the subject ID. So here we have subject number one. 
The second record contains the time. And so you'll see 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, et cetera. So these are half hour intervals and it goes up to 24 hours. And then this is the plasma concentration for that, study, for that subject at steady state. Then it'll change after 24 hours to subject number two, and we'll get again zero to 24 hours for subject number two and the plasma concentrations for that subject and right the way throughout for all of the subjects in the study. Now, the PD part of the model, first of all, here are some sample PD profiles. As I said, these are uh, at baseline and weeks uh, six, nine, and 12. Now, the first thing to note is because it's running over 12 weeks, we have 84 days and the plasma uh, concentration reaches steady state approximately at day four. So what we would find is that if we were to be solving differential equations, we'd be solving the same differential equation and getting the same results approximately 80 times over from day four to day 84. And we'd be essentially repeating ourselves over and over again and just burning up our computing time. And secondly, the step size, we've only got one, two, three, four uh, HbA1c values for each subject. And we're using a tiny step size because the step size for solving the diff equations will be uh, governed by the plasma concentration values. So it will be a lot less than 24 hour. I don't know what it would be uh, to be precise. So you can see that this is a good candidate for our method of averaging. So let me show you something about the PD model. And again, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on this. I'll give you a reference. The PD model was an indirect response model and it was an indirect response model where the drug reduces the um, plasma um, uh, glucose and that will reduce the production of or the uh, glycation of hemoglobin. So it, it acts the effect of the drug, which I just call E for the moment here, is to reduce the input. So this is a, a model one in those four models that I showed you earlier on. And so the effect E then is written this way here. It consists of a, a placebo component um, and then the, uh, the effect, actual effect of the drug itself. And this is modulated by the baseline um, uh, like uh, HbA1c value, which is what HC, oh, by the way, HT, I should have said, represents the HbA1c values at time T, and EP and EC are placebo and drug effects, respectively. And we, down here, we have then, we see that the drug effect is, follows a, an Emax model. Now, the nice thing about this Emax model is that the, when we come to integrate that, this is the function that we're going to have to integrate to get E average. When we come to integrate that, the Emax value can be taken outside. So all we've got to integrate is CT divided by CT plus EC50. And then later on, we can multiply that by Emax. So when we look at the code, you won't see any Emax in the code. And that's the reason for that. Now, again, um, you, if you want more details on this model, the uh, De Wint, Willem de Winter uh, and colleagues in the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology 2017, you'll find uh, the details of that model. So then we'll do a comparison. So somebody asked me earlier on how big was the, the effect. So let's have a look and see. So the PD model in this case was fitted twice to the data. Once using what you'd call conventional methodology of the differential equation solver uh, in non-MEM, and the second time using MAV, the method of averaging. And first of all, we will take a look at uh, what the results look like. So in this column here, I have the method of averaging. And in this column, I have the numerical differential equation solver. Now, down along here, it tells me, first of all, the objective function value, minus 5093.866, minus 5093.84. You'll see very little difference between them. And then we have the various parameters in the model. I'm not going to go through each one of them. Um, Give after each one in brackets, you'll see it's standard error. And what you'll find when you look at these in, in uh, some detail is that the, uh, 
the, the difference between the two methods is very, very small in all cases. So essentially what we've got is that the method of averaging is giving us results that are very, very similar to what we get when we use the differential equation solver. But now the really good news is this. These are the run times. And again, here I have the numerical differential equation solver and that these are given in seconds. So the estimation step is 12,000 and 31 with uh, the differential equation solver and 15,000 for the covariance step. And look at this, for the method of averaging, 12 seconds as opposed to 12,000 and 13 seconds as opposed to 15,000. So we went from approximately eight hours for the total run using the differential equation solver to 25 seconds. Now, when I ran this the first time, I actually thought something had gone wrong because non-MEM finished so quickly. And it was only when I looked at the output file that I realized the thing had gone wrong, everything had gone perfectly right. Um, and this was an enormous uh, saving in terms of computing time. And from the whole point of view of model development, um, in our case, we were using the model for to simulate and for to run these simulations, et cetera. We wanted to run thousands and thousands of simulations. Well, that clearly wasn't going to be possible if we were going to use the differential equation solver. Um, and but using the method of averaging, which is what we did use, we were able to run our thousands of simulations in the space of a number of hours. So there's an enormous gain uh, in terms of uh, the computational burden and a, a very significant one, both from the point of view of model development and from the point of view of using the model then, in our case, for, from the, uh, from the, for the uh, use being for to uh, run some simulations. So again, I'll stop there before. I'm going to go on now in a few moments and I'm going to talk to you in more some detail about the actual code and the Funk A code and the non-MEM control stream, et cetera, that I used for to implement this so that you'll have an idea how it can be done. So I'll stop and take any questions if there are any um, questions at this stage. Yeah, Adrian, we have a couple. Uh, can we use the method of averaging in donor models or transit compartment models? Um, again, I don't know because I haven't studied it, but what, and that's why I've given you uh, the, the mathematics here. If you can take the, uh, the mathematics that I've given you and try and apply that to these other models, then um, it, it become quickly become apparent whether or not you can do it. So the next question is, do we consider residual unexplained variability when we use the method of averaging in non -men? Uh, Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So there, there is yeah, one we, more question. We have between subject variability. We have residual, vari in other words, we have Asians and we have epsilons. I think that's what, what the question was. And yes, indeed, and we do. There is one more question. So what are the limitations of method of averaging? It, the, 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 that I know of, there are only two limitations. One is that the plasma concentrations reach steady state fairly quickly. And I've suggested that if that's not the case, you might be able to do a workaround by having by splitting up the entire study into different segments. Uh, say a segment during which you do have a steady state and perhaps a segment before that. And you might be able to use different um, profiles for the subjects, depending on whereabouts you are in, in, in across that time span. Um, the second um, uh, limitation is this assumption that which was key to the, those integrals that I did, where I was able to assume that yt, although it is a function of time, when I integrate it across time, I treated it as being constant. Now, I only integrated across one dosing interval. So if you uh, take one dosing interval, and if it's reasonable approximation to assume that the PD response does not change very much over a single dosing interval, then the method will work well. If, of course, that's not true, the method will probably not work very well at all. And in fact, that's why I show you here this comparison between the two. I would urge people using this method 
to uh, run this comparison in order to be sure that your the conditions that you have met actually it's a good way also of checking your uh, coding that you've actually coded it correctly and so if you get similar results uh, for both methods then it'll give you um, some uh, reassurance that uh, the, that the uh, conditions are right for using this method. Now, one of the things I would suggest to people is if you're going to use this method while you're uh, developing a model, you might consider your first, your baseline model at the very beginning of your process of model building, and you might run it with both methods. And if they give you similar results as they did here, you could then um, feel good about using the method of averaging as you go about your model building. And given the reduction in uh, computing uh, time, that would give you um, make your model building a lot easier. And then what I would do is when I had finished building the model and I come to my final model, I would try fitting it with both methods just to make sure that I was still getting uh, similar results for the two and that the method of averaging was working well. Thank okay, you. So, Those are the so, questions we have for now. No, okay. So, so we'll go on then. Oh, sorry, we have another question. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, this is this is Aruna here. I just yeah. wanted to um, mention that this is, it's going to be 12 p.m. Eastern in the U.S. now. And uh, we would be going on for at least another half hour, Adrian. Would that be right? Uh, maybe not that long. Maybe okay. not that long. Okay. So, uh, so maybe about 20 minutes. So I just wanted, uh, wanted uh, the participants to be aware. And again, in fact, I am also very interested because this is where we are getting into the meat of the presentation. That's right. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm curious to see what Adrian has to share with us uh, as we get into the depth of this uh, method of averaging. Go ahead, Adrian, thank you. Okay, thank you, Aruna. Uh, maybe it may not even take me 15 minutes. It depends on uh, how quickly I speak. But um, so what I'm going to do then is I'm just going to show you some of the code uh, that I used. And I'm not going to show you in very fine detail, but I'll give you an outline so that you'll be able to see what's going on. And um, first of all, here's the non mem control stream. Now we have here the usual things, a dollar prob statement, a dollar input, dollar data. They're all the same as you'd usually have. The um, things that are different I've outlined in red. First one here is dollar sub. Dollar sub means is to tell non-mem that you have a subroutine and other means that it's other than uh, the subroutines for the model or, and so on. And you give it the name of the file dot F90. Now this is the name of the, my, I have a comment in here. This is the name of the file that contains the funk A code. Now remember what's going to happen. As non-mem is doing its computing, it's going to jump out a non-mem into this separate file and it's going to execute the code in that and go back to non-mem. Non-mem will do some more computing. It'll jump out again. So it'll go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And this statement here, simply tells it the name of the file to use. And the .f90 simply tells it that it's a Fortran 90 file. Um, I'm not sure whether that's absolutely essential that it should be type .f90. I've used that and that works. And um, whether or not anything else works, I don't know. Then I have a dollar pred block. And in here, I'll have the usual things that you'll have, code to define the parameters using theta, eta, et cetera, et cetera. And then for the method of averaging using the funk A routine, I'll have some special code. So I'll show you and talk you through that special code. Now, the first thing is um, there's a, an if mu end is equal to one. That's, uh, in other words, if we are subject initialization. I've commented it at the back here. In other words, I'm going to set the method of averaging, the E average, to be zero. Um, because of course it'll be zero for placebo subjects and then for non-placebo subjects, we'll change its value. The next thing we'll do is I have, if I call equals one. Now, um, you, I'm sure you know that if an I call is one, we're at problem initialization. So this is at the beginning of a non-mem problem. 
And so what I want to do is I want to do something special at the beginning uh, to set things up for later on. So here we'll see where I call funk A. See funk A here. Now funk A is called and vector A is sent out to funk A. So we have to send certain information when we jump out of non-mem into this code that we've got up here. And that information is sent out through this vector. Now in this case, I'm going to, and here's the vector, vector A, and it has a number of uh, elements. In this case, I'm only using one. And that element is a flag for to tell funk A that this is problem initialization. And the way I tell it is I give this a negative value. I've given it a value of minus five. Any negative value would do here. Um, and of course, you can decide what kind of flag you want. I chose this flag where it'll be negative if it's problem initialization. And as you'll see in a few moments, it'll be positive for uh, any other case. So the negative value in, in indicates initialization. And then we have an end if statement. So that little block there just jumps out to vector to func A for problem initialization. And you'll see in a few moments what happens when we go to func A for problem initialization. So then we we'll move on. Now, if we're not doing problem initialization, we want to calculate an actual value of the average. So we're not initializing things. So again, I have an if statement. So if I call is greater than one, so it's not problem initialization. If dose is greater than zero, in other words, it's not a placebo subject. For a placebo subject, remember that the E average is, has already been set to zero because they don't have any plasma concentration uh, of drug. Um, and for new in is not equal to two. In other words, um, I only need for to jump out to funk A to calculate E average for each subject uh, for the first dosing into, for the first observation and not for every subsequent observation. So now here's my vector A. I'm going to, here's where I'm going to jump out to funk A and I've got to give it a vector. So the first part of vector A, remember, is a flag. And now it's plus five rather than minus five as it was previously. And the plus five is to tell it that we're not doing initialization. Now we want to calculate an actual E average. The second part of vector A is the ID. So we have to tell it which subject it's to calculate the E average for. And the third thing it needs is it needs to know what's the EC50 right now? Because remember that EC50 will change according as non-MEM does the, uh, the, the model fitting. So it needs to know, it's not initialization, it needs to know the ID and the current value of EC50. And when all those are sent in here in vector A, Funk A will do the computation, calculate E average and send it back to non-MEM. And here we are, E average is sent back. And then we'll have the rest of the code that defines the model using the E average. So this is how we calculate the E average, and then we use it here. And then I'll have the dollar theta, dollar omega, et cetera, et cetera, all the other stuff that you'd normally have in a non-MEM control stream. So that's my non-MEM control stream. And the only other thing now that we need is we need the, the funk A routine itself. So, and again, I'm not going to go in minute detail. I'll give you, I'll talk in general about this code. So this is Fortran code and it's stored in a separate file that's named in the non-mem control stream. That file that I mentioned back here called filename.f90. So this is what's stored in that file. So first of all, you'll see that the function func a has three arguments. Now the first of these arguments x is that vector a. It's now called x once you leave non-mem and go into func A, the argument is called X. You could rename it if you want, but the default is X, so I use that. So X is the vector called vector A in the non-mem control stream. So when we jump in here, the value vector A1, vector A2, vector A3 will all be stored in here as X1, X2, and X3. There are some statements then, which are standard Fortran statements about double precision, et cetera. And in fact, I just a little note to you here, 
the version of non-mem has been updated, of course, since I originally wrote this code. And um, so they may have to make some small changes that are, uh, uh, details are given in, in the non-mem uh, help guides uh, on this funk A and using the funk A. So some of these statements are a bit out of date now. Now there's a save statement here. And remember that's this PK uh, profiles, one for every subject at steady state in our data set. So we want to save that in between calls. So when we don't want to have to keep reading it from a data file because that would take a lot of computing time as well. So there's a save statement that uh, saves that. And then there's a dimension statement that shows that the X, X1 and X2 are arrays. At the time I wrote this, nine was the limit. I think the, the limit may be slightly changed since then, but it doesn't matter. Nine is more than adequate. We only use three. And this array down here, PK dat, that's where I'm going to store all these PK profiles, steady state profiles. There are going to be three columns. The first column will contain the subject ID, so I'll know which subject it applies to. The second column will contain the time, and the third column will contain the plasma concentration. And if you go back in my slides, you'll see where I showed you the beginning of the file, which contained these three values. And I've made it 10,000. All you've got to do is make sure that this number here is bigger than the number of records that you have in that file. Okay, so that's the first part. Now, the next part now, this part, what the code shown on this slide is what happens at problem initialization. Now at problem initialization, what we've got to do is read all the PK model predicted steady state concentrations from our file. And I got, we've called the file pkss.txt. And we want to read that into memory. So here's what we do. So if X1 is less than zero, remember that X1 is vector a1. And it's the flag to say whether or not we're dealing with problem initialization. So if it's less than zero, then, then we do all this, which is problem initialization. Basically, what we do is we open that file. There's the file name there that contains these plasma concentration values. And then down here, we read them. And we read the subject ID, the PK time, and the plasma concentration C are read from that file. And they're stored then in this array that I call PK dat for PK data. And in the first column is the subject ID. In the second column is the time. Remember, that's every half hour intervals. And in the third column is C, the plasma concentration. And all of that funk A is set equal to zero because, of course, this code doesn't calculate an E average. This code is just about initialization and reading the data into memory. So that's what happens when it reads the data into memory. So that's done once for the entire problem. Now, when we come to computing the E average, so we're at non-initialization, we want to compute E average for a subject. Now the subject ID will be in X2, it was vector A2, and the EC50 value was stored in vector A3. So here we have, uh, that calculation being done. So um, again, we, I, I'm not going to go through it in, in fine uh, detail, except to tell you that the subject ID is X2. So we, we have to pick out the subject ID from this array PK dash for the particular subject we're dealing with. And CT for that subject is given in PK dash three. And the current value of EC50 is given in X3 vector A3. And so what this does is it calculates the plasma concentration divided by the EC50 plus the plasma concentration. So that's my uh, Emax model without the Emax parameter. And I add that up, I keep adding to that, and I sum across equally spaced time. So I'm going to approximate the integral by basically just the sum of all the values. And then I'm going to divide by the number of values that I have. And the number of values is for this particular subject is in I count. And I get I count, I divide by I count. Now I have to divide by real I count because this is Fortran code and I count is an integer and E is a real number. So I've got to divide by real. And so what that does then is it gives me my E average and I, that's put into funk A and then returned back to non-mem. 
So every time non-mem goes to func A, the very first time it goes to func A, it'll be an initialization. And it will just read all the data from the appropriate file and store it in this array here called PK dat. That's the first time. Every other time that non-mem goes to func A, it will calculate an, an E average, which is here, and then return it back by means of func A and return back to non-mem. So go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, doing that all the time. And so that's the basics of the, uh, the non-mem code. And before I finish, a few conclusions. So the M average has, I believe, potential to increase computing efficiency when we're fitting and building and using PKPD models. And um, the reduction in computing time, as you've seen, is, is for this particular example is very dramatic and it should facilitate the building and testing of the models. And the other thing I just thrown in here is a little comment that Funk A may have other applications. So you may have other examples of cases or models where you want to be able to jump out of non-mem to another piece of code that will calculate some function or other and then jump back again. So the Funk A utility is a very nice utility for to do that. And finally, I'll leave you with a uh, reference that uh, describes uh, that this whole presentation is based on th this work in JPP in uh, 2015, and the, the uh, reference is given there. So with that, I'll uh, finish and uh, thank you all for your attention. And once again, thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, share this with you. Thank you, Adrian, and okay. uh, uh, really appreciate you walking us through this cool tactic. Um, I wanted to see if we have more questions. So Arun, uh, can you please let us know if there are any questions that have come up? No, I don't know. At that time, we don't have any additional questions. So we are good to go. Um, any of the participants would like to uh, ask a question of Adrian, uh, you can also, we can also facilitate that. So you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. That way you're able to ask a question by talking into the microphone here. I know earlier we had one of the participants who wanted to ask a verbal question and maybe we were not able to unmute them in time. I actually don't see any, any movement there. If anything comes up, please do let us know. So it seems like there are a few questions that people have. Uh, Ramesh and Arun, are you able to identify them and maybe unmute them? Yes, sir, just a moment. So there is one question from Rahman. If we want to see drug effect by using linear Emacs or sigmoidal Emacs model, can we still use method of averaging? Um, yes, the, the, the function that you use doesn't matter. Um, if this is not just an Emacs model, you can put any function at all in there and, uh, and then average it. So I there's no, no restriction whatsoever in terms of the uh, exposure response model. Thanks, Eugene. I think that's the final question we have. Any yeah. other last minute questions? I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, the participants actually leave the meeting feeling good about attending this and have really learned something from here. Uh, if there are no new questions, I think there is one last question that just popped up. 
So the question is, if we calculate the year average inside a non-mem, instead of using func A, would that also work? Or we need to mention the func A as a separate? Um, I'd love to know how you do that. Uh, how would you do that inside non-mem? Because if I knew how to do that, I, would, I wouldn't have had to use func A at all. But uh, it wasn't clear to me how that could be done. I think it, it's just a question, maybe like, can we do that? Or oh, can we possible? do it? Yeah, um, I, well, I, I don't see any simple way to do it. Um, the trouble with this thing is, of course, when I first uh, came, you know, decided to use the method of averaging, I realized I had to calculate E average. And I, it immediately cropped into my head, ah, this is, I'll use Funk A for this. And once you see a solution to your problem, you, you stop looking for other possible solutions. So I couldn't say for sure that there aren't other ways of going about this. Um, and actually, of course, I'd be interested to know if somebody else has a different solution. But uh, I, I, I haven't looked that you know, extensively or that diligently to see if there's an alternative way of doing it. There may well be. Yep. Thanks, Eugene. OK, you're welcome. Thank you again. Adrian, really appreciate this. And I think there was one uh, technical question in terms of whether slides would be shared. Um, yes, this presentation as well as the slides will be shared um, after this workshop. So we will present the talk will be shared on the YouTube channel, and then we will give you a link from where you would be able to find the slide deck and post this workshop if you still if once you have tried of course you would be trying out this new technique that adrian has uh, has shared with you and if something comes up please feel free to reach out to us on our email and we would we can direct your questions to adrian um, after the workshop as well Thank you, Adrian. Um, and if you stop sharing, I will quickly share a few slides. Um, and here I want to uh, talk about our next coming workshop. Let me share my screen. Hope you can see my screen now. So our next coming workshop is going to be uh, another uh, webinar or a, or a workshop, which is going to be a, a one session talk as well, which is going to be on model informed drug development by Rick Lennard, uh, who's currently in the University of Florida, but many of us know him as uh, uh, the head of uh, pharmacometrics, clinical pharmacology at Pfizer, and he's going to be um, bringing his depth and breadth of knowledge. Uh, he also, I, you know, I would not be wrong to say that he also has like about 40 years of experience doing drug development. Um, so yeah, look forward to seeing you uh, at that workshop, which is going to be on May uh, 26th. And following uh, Rick's workshop, our next workshop is actually going to be um, uh, a training series, which is going to be talking more in depth about the fundamentals of pharmacometrics, uh, fundamentals of using R, and also giving you an exposure to using Sartara's new tool which is Rx and LME. And please stand by to hear more about that from us. So that will be in the month of June, which is gonna be a three month um, certified program through Project Dantabhaktuni. And I look forward to seeing you there. Please spread the word. 
um, and we do have restrictions on the number of uh, participants who can attend that workshop. Uh, now, moving on to, again, a workshop of this size would not have been possible without uh, the work and support and, um, and, and uh, contribution from many of our members. I want to acknowledge Arun, who has been, who's our uh, a Zoom expert, who's always there to help us. Without him, uh, we would have gone through a lot more uh, problems, I should say. Ramya, who who is been an um, a volunteer who's been helping with our workshops for over a year now. Rajan, again. Uh, you know, Rajan is, I always say that he's the wind beneath my wings when it comes to all of these workshops and, and uh, spreading the word and all his students who've been playing a critical role for us. Uh, we also are sending Rajan our best wishes um, for his speedy recovery. He couldn't be here today with us uh, because he's dealing with a health condition but we are sending him our best wishes and we look forward to seeing him back on our workshops uh, again. And uh, Ramesh, uh, Krishna, Partha, again, Partha is the one who, who is Adrian's good friend and colleague who reached out to Adrian to have him here for our talk. Thank you so much, Partha, for your contribution here. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in our future workshops. Again, a few words of our, about our sponsor, PharmaPro Consulting, which is a consulting company specializing in clinical pharmacology, data management, uh, strategic advice, modeling and simulation, and also regulatory affairs. Um, the company is based in the US and currently uh, the team is spread in six countries, over 25 or so team members, many of whom have over 20 years of drug development experience. Uh, and we would uh, bring some of our team members in our future workshops to present as well. Thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you in our future workshops and stay tuned. Um, to hear more about our next workshops and also the Pharmacometrics program, which is going to start from the month of June. Another good news that I also want to share is that we have a website now, so you can visit our website, which is uh, dontabhaktuni.org. So uh, look forward to seeing you there and Thank you for being with us and thank you for giving us this opportunity to uh, uh, give you this new talk and uh, we look forward to seeing you in our future workshop.